Thank you, Nate. Good to see you this morning. Welcome to chapel. Good to have our trustees here. We love these folks. They uh, care deeply about you, our students, and our faculty, and it's always good to have fellowship with them. I'm super excited to have them here. I'm really excited to have our guests with us today in chapel. Robert Hyde and Paul Will are with us. I'll bring them up on the stage here in just a moment. Tell you a little bit about them before they come up and uh, how I connected with them. I guess it would have been 2014 or 15. I can't remember which one it was, but it was around that time, 14. And uh, I was the dean of the college at Southeastern up in North Carolina. Dr. Aiken was constantly after us in the college to start a prison program. We had heard about these prison programs where we would train inmates to do pastoral ministry in a four-year baccalaureate degree program. And as you can imagine, there's lots of doing to be done with that. Very expensive, lots of red tape with governments and things like that. It just didn't seem like that was really going to be feasible. But after a couple years, God had just kicked the doors open. And there we were on a path to really be able to put that together. So we jumped on an airplane and we came down to New Orleans where it all started. This whole nationwide movement now all started at NOBTS. 1994 under president number seven, Landrum Level, we had... Um, a new warden at Angola Prison, one of the bloodiest prisons in the United States. And he was a new warden there. They had just burned through wardens that were coming in there trying to fix this. And not knowing what to do, he turned to Christ and invited a seminary, of all things to try, a seminary to go into the prisons there. And uh, here we are some 20 plus years later and God has done amazing, or 30 plus years later, and God has done remarkable, amazing things, not just through Angola, but now in the prisons in Mississippi and in Florida and in Georgia and even up in North Carolina. When I came down to New Orleans, drove over to Angola, uh, me and the team that I brought, we walked into the prisons, met all the administrators and all those types of things, but the precious things that we got to meet, the precious ones we got to meet, uh, that day were a couple of the students and I can remember meeting Robert Hyde and I can remember meeting Paul Will and just two stories that scream God's grace. This is a real reminder to us in these moments that God can save anybody and I'm reminded even as I approach this moment with us today uh, a passage that has been reverberating in my mind a lot this semester Isaiah chapter 42 uh, verse number two and three it's a passage about the servant of the Lord. He will not, it says. A, a bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering flax he will not put out. These are references to the marginalized. References to the throwaways of society that normally folks don't care about. It says of our Messiah there, a prophecy of him, is that these are precisely the people he will love, that he will redeem, and that he will care for. And uh, we've gotten to see that in the prisons of Angola, God doing what only God can do. And so we've gotten to be a part of that. And uh, sure enough, in North Carolina, we had an opportunity to build a program like that. And I got to say, I've been in education, some kind of higher education now, I don't know how many years. But in all the hundreds of classes I have taught, hands down, far and away, my favorite, favorite, favorite class I've ever gotten to teach was in the prison of North Carolina with those inmates. And Paul and I actually get to go back in December uh, for that graduating class of students that I got to teach and we'll get to participate in those those ceremonies and so that's going to be just a really wonderful thing. Uh, brothers, would you come up here on the stage and let's have a conversation with everybody. Would you welcome uh, Robert Hyde and Paul Will. Well guys, we've wanted to do this for a, a while now and um, Obviously, we want to hear your stories today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say uh, on behalf of your alma mater, we love you and we're proud of you. Uh, I have to say maybe more proud than I've ever been of any students we've ever had and just a delight to see God's grace in your life and uh, both of you out now and doing fantastic, wonderful things for the kingdom and uh, look forward to seeing how God continues to use you. Uh, let me real quick, and you guys can correct the details here if I get them wrong. Uh, Paul Will, you are um, you work in the communications department for the Prison Seminary Fellowship, which is, maybe just tell us a little bit about that in just a second, 
Prison Seminary Fellowship, what all it does and how this is spread across the country. And then also the Bartow Baptist Association in Georgia, which is Lottie Moon's home association. Uh, he's responsible for outreach in there as well. So, uh, and then Robert Hyde, you are the director of programs now at the Parchman Prison, which is one of our prisons where we're doing the same kind of thing in the state of Mississippi. And so now he's working and teaching in that context and uh, future soon to be PhD student with us to study philosophy, right? So, okay. So Paul, I'll start with you. Tell us a, a, just a, quickly about your role and your responsibility of Prison Seminary Fellowship and uh, Bartow Baptist Association. Yeah, it's um, very interesting to go to work for who was once my warden and now be part of communications and sustainability efforts for what now is a national um, outreach program. So I work for the foundation in this capacity to curate the story, right? It's just a wonderful redemption story that Jesus has um, wrought upon our lives and we're the beneficiaries of. So what do I do? Um, right now, specifically, I have designed our last website page to curate story and information. And um, as a result of this and some of the other things that we've been doing, I've been backtracking and gaining access to all the stories like Roberts and, other, and our other graduates across the country in 19 different states and 26 different programs to start our next social media campaign. So um, I can't tell you to how important it is for me to be involved in that work because, you know, to be a beneficiary of something that seemed so strange to do on behalf of a seminary program. You know, to go to a place like Angola, which is like seemingly the most unfavorable set of circumstances, and um, to go out and advance that same cause, it's, it's, uh, it couldn't be more rewarding. So that's what I do there. Um, I've recently taken a job with the Baptist Association of Bartow County, which um, President Dew has just reminded us that it's the home of Lottie Moon. Missions are very important. So it's kind of ironic that I have gone from kind of like this missionary state from Angola to a home place where one of our most beloved missionaries is from. So what do I do there? I am uh, currently developing programs for strategic outreach to marginalized peoples group. What a great reference to the passage in Isaiah. Um, there are five homeless encampments throughout that county. And, and let me tell you, substance abuse is a big issue out here in our world. And um, the church is not free from the impact of that. And I can tell you that the association of Bartow County is, is taking it very seriously, and they are, um, again, championing a cause that I think Jesus would always remind us of, to go out and beat the bushes and find those redemption stories that he came to, you know, I think, exemplify most, you know, from ashes to beauty. Amen. So that's what I do. Amen. Robert, tell us about your, your role um, before we jump into your stories. Tell us about your role as the director of programs at Parchman. So they have programs at Parchman, right? What they have not had was someone who did it like we did it here in Louisiana. Everything that we were, tr I would say, trained how to do through the Christian ministry into the pastoral ministry curriculums really set us up to be able to do what we did. We probably had a half a dozen jobs simultaneously for 10 years while we were at Angola. I get out, I'm riding down the road visiting family in Kentucky, Bro Kane calls me and you know that voice, and I got a job for you boy. And, All right, yes sir. So once he told me, he basically wanted me to do for him what I'd already been doing in Angola, I said, okay, when do I start? So that was it. Um, I showed up there on July 5th and it took a month to get to know everything and uh, learn who's who and what's what. And so now I direct all programming, all ABE, GED, um, all of your re-entry, VOTEC, pre-release, all of that. And then I'm supervising all the rebuilds for all the schools, you know, BTS Extension Center included. So that's what I'll be doing. And then building a system that actually can have one place where superintendents and commissioners can find out what's going on with one phone call. So tell us, um, let's start, Paul, with you over here, and we'll come to you, Robert, as well. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your life before Angola, how you grew up, how you sure. ended up in prison, mm -hmm. and what put you there? Big question. So all of us, obviously, uh, start out in a place and a time with complex circumstances. I was born uh, in Cape May, New Jersey, uh, fatherless to a teenage mother. 
And as you can imagine, you know, the troubles that come with that. Uh, my mother was very young and she lost her father very young. My grandfather, who was essentially that core father figure in my very early years, he died when I was four. So the trajectory of my life was troubled essentially from the womb. You know, my biological father died in a commercial fishing accident months before I was born. And um, yeah, so complex, full of rejection and absence. Um, so I went on through life. By the time I was 13, I was dabbling and you know, using marijuana, drinking a little bit, and that progressed pretty rapidly to the time I was 21 years old. Uh, I had a thousand dollar a week heroin habit by the time I was 21 interstate drug trafficking between New Jersey, Philadelphia, and New York. And eventually, over the next couple years, I went to a rehab program in Virginia and then moved to New Orleans, of all places, when I was 25. And I was ripping and running in this city. I know not, I guess, everybody in here, not everybody in here is probably old enough to remember the St. Thomas or the Melphamine or the Magnolia or the Calliope. You know, I was. I was one of those crazy white boys that would go into Rose Tavern and go into those places because that's just who I was. Didn't care. And uh, subsequently arrested for an aggravated kidnapping, drug-related attempted, you know, I got in a car with somebody with a handgun and asked them to essentially take me to the place where I was going to commit suicide because I was so um, paralyzed and hopeless in life, you know, complete nihilist in all, imagine, in, you know, in every kind of imagination possible. You stare into nothing long enough and hard enough and focused enough, and you participate in um, hopeless activity, you become empty pretty quick and permanently empty in so many ways in your own mind. But yet, you know, Jesus. So, you know, we're born, like I said, in these places in these times that are chronologically affixed in this creation that we're in, but then comes that moment when the salvation history of Christ intersects with our life and changes that trajectory completely. So I found myself uh, convicted um, of an aggravated kidnapping in Jefferson Parish and sentenced to a natural life sentence in, um, here in Louisiana and was remanded to the Department of Corrections to serve out the rest of my life in Angola. But Jesus, I sit on the stage. <laughs> you know, look, there's a happy ending to that story, right? Beautiful wife and our son who is here on campus pursuing his master's degree. What? A crazy story. Real quick, would you introduce your wife? Amy? I would love to. She's the most precious thing in the universe. So this is my wife, Mrs. Amy Will, and this is my son, Harrison Crossover. Um, God has a sense of humor, no doubt. Little red-headed guy right there, which I used to be, used to be maybe. Um, so anyway, long story short and all that, um, I came to Christ a little... Uh, Spanish minister came into the jail and witnessed the gospel to me and it was at that point that I realized that Yahweh was my dad. And the irony of this is like when I went to tell this story to my family back at home, it was, it was my biological father's birthday. So it was this huge, amazing personal healing point that transformed my life. And in that moment, the thing that I knew that I would, that I felt most regretful was is I never believed that God was my dad. And I instantly knew that, and immediately I knew that I had a different identity too, and I now could live differently than I had always lived. And um, got sent to prison in Angola, and um, the NOBTS was there. Transformed my life, um, men and women of this institution, I cannot speak more highly of, and how important that this effort is, because that they reparented me, um, brought me back from an, a, a trauma estate to a new state of equilibrium, to a state of mature um, sonship in the Lord, understanding my role, my responsibility, what creative agencies we were, and the power of calling. Ah, uh, yeah. That's awesome. Crazy stuff. I want to hear more um, just a minute about program, uh, our, our academic program in there, and how that prepared you. Tell us real quick how you ended up in Angola. Well, similar to Paul, young mother, uh, 17, uh, never knew my dad, never knew any extended family. They had divorced before I was a year old, and she had moved down here. 
Long story short, she was on her third husband by 23, and that husband was violent and abusive, uh, beat severely me and my little brother daily and beat her atrociously. And it finally ended up with her having a 12-gauge shotgun in the ribs. And uh, don't really know what happened. All I know is it, it happened. Don't know how it happened. No one was prosecuted. They were both uh, police officers. So I don't know what happened to the scene. But from that day forward, I was six years old. She was gone, never knew my dad. So my grandfather adopted me. He made a good living, but he was aloof, uncommunicative. So uh, from really from six years old forward, I had two things that drove me. One was an anger at all men that mistreat women. All boys who were bullies hated them, got me into a lot of trouble. I fought constantly, never went to the same school two years in a row. And uh, as I got older and got bigger, those schoolyard scuffles turned into real damage. Um, a lot of drinking and drugs. I had failed at everything I'd tried, no mentorship, no guidance. And I'd gotten to a point to where I just, I didn't want to look in the mirror. I really did. I couldn't stand who I was. I thought I was irreparable, ugly, unwanted and um, got to that place in life to where I'm just dark and lost and intoxicated one night at a party and caused a man's death. We got into a fight behind the abuse he had caused to a woman and I beat him severely and caused his death and I was sentenced uh, to 35 years for manslaughter and um, I did everything up until that point that every man ought not do. Every dark thing that every person can do, that was my life. Just out in the streets, listening to every other idiot who knew less than I did about where to go in life. I, it never occurred to me to go to people who were wiser until I had lost everything. So the short of my story is just early trauma, early abuse, early loss, early everything that is negative, and then I just walked through the streets and just got worse and worse as time went on. I met you two in 14, and you changed. I remember me and Seth Bible and Jason Fowler walk into that little room where we were at, meeting the two of you and Ted and some others, <laughs> and I can remember um, all of us walked out of there so struck by the impact that the gospel had made in your lives, it really removed any remaining lingering doubt about starting what we were about to start up in North Carolina. Uh, it really became the catalyst when we left to say, oh yes, we have to do this. We did. And then when I taught myself years later, once we'd gotten it built and up and running, I mean, those, those men changed me. They changed me radically, you know, from being just this guy that wanted to uh, be a big shot intellectually to you see the gospel impact people's lives that way and it just all of a sudden starts to re-engineer your own heart and everything. So tell us about, uh, by the time I met you, your lives were redeemed. You, it, grace was beautiful all over your lives. Tell us about the program and the discipleship that you went through within OBTS and what you learned and how that worked. So I like to call Jesus my first cellmate. My conversion was after I had realized I had become, I'd spent my whole life hating men that abused people. And then I realized in that cell that I had become the very thing I hated my whole life. I had become that person that I hated because I had now been that violent person. So I swore to myself, I'd never do that again, swore to the Lord. I uh, met Jesus right there, broke me into a million pieces, but for the first time I could look in the mirror again and be okay with the possibility that I knew was going to come. So I got this clown as of a librarian who kept trying to bring me Danielle Steele romance novels to my cell. Man, knock it off, man. Bring me a Bible. I don't know what it is with men and romance novels and books. Maybe we miss the ladies. I mean, anyway, it's real. It's a real thing. So some of them disguise it in the Western version, but it's the same thing. You know what I'm talking about. So some of you probably have some at home. I'm just saying. Anyway, I got the Bible, started reading it, and that started me on my path. I went through about 10 years. 
studying with Jehovah's Witnesses, studying by myself, studying here and there. And I went through that journey for about a decade of trying to find the truth of Jesus, who he is. And then finally, I got to a place in 2011 where I just, I just quit trying to grip and grasp and try to figure it out, being the intellectual. And I said, okay, Lord, that's it. I don't know where to go now. I don't know what to do. So uh, I used to do automotive airbrushing and custom trucks and bikes and all that. And one of those trucks won first place at the biggest truck show in the country. That caused the wardens to have photo ops. And they said, is there something we can do for you? I said, yeah, you can send me to NOBTS. I want to go to Angola. I want to go to seminary. I'm at a place where I need to learn how to be a minister. And so the warden said, okay. And three weeks later, I was reclassed. I meet this guy, and I began a process of learning all the theological language, learning how to reorient my entire mind around true church history, true church scripture, you know, in, in the hermeneutic traditions, right, all the ways that we should properly look at things. And it radically changed everything for me. I had been a person whose heart had broke and who came to Jesus, but it wasn't until I got a chance to come to NOBTS at Angola that I began to realize what that really could be. And for the first time in my life, I really felt like I could become that man that the Lord designed me to be, that man that I should have been all along. And so I got a chance to go through the six, seven years in through the Master of Arts and met this brother along the way who mentored me and pastored me and helped me learn what it was to be the person I should have been. So Paul, you were already pretty far into the process at this point. Tell us about how you entered <laughs> into all of this and then pick up right there. If you would. So I, I started my NOBTS journey in um, August of 03. It was a um, pretty accelerated journey at that point because they, they had initiated summer semesters and I, you know, I got my AA and uh, my BA a couple, three years, 10 months later. But I've always been this person that is, um, and I just want to build things. Um, but in order to build things right, sometimes you got to tear some things down. So anyway, um, by that point, the Lord had started to work. This is 2006. I had graduated undergraduate, and um, the Lord had started to work this impossible dream in my life which was to found a fully constituted Southern Baptist church in you know, a corrections institution. Um, it was never done before. And um, you know, I heard a lot of voices from a lot of people, you know, never, never, never. And along the way, Jesus kind of taught me that he specializes in nevers. And if, you've, if you have never heard anyone tell you things will never happen, you just keep living in this gospel life. And sooner or later, you know, someone will tell you that that could never happen. And Jesus will walk alongside you and say, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And I specialize in those circumstances because I was the one who came out of the grave. So anyway, the Lord started to initiate this impossible dream. Um, and um, I figured, well, how does that work? What does the fellowship of the Lord look like in this institution like that? So I ended up petitioning um, the warden and the chaplain's department to initiate what was called um, the Baptist Bible study at the you know, kind of request of a lot of guys. This is long before Robert got there because I was an insatiable librarian. Um, you know, our library at the NOBTS in Angola started out in uh, like a four, four drawer filing cabinet and it's now one of the premier libraries in the country. And, uh, so I was one of those nut jobs who read everything that came through the door because I was obsessed to try and fill in all of my um, knowledge gaps, which were vast and many at the time, and um, just dreaming towards that. So a lot of guys were like, Paul, will you start a Bible study? So we did, and long story short, six years later, by the time Robert had gotten there, we had institutional approval to start an institutional church inside of the prison from Warden Kane at the time. Well, that just kept blowing and going and exploded. And, and then we petitioned the Washington Baptist Association for, well, Hillcrest Baptist Church for missionary status and that they would walk us through that. And then we kind of dreamed like, how would that, how would that happen? Um, so the first thing that they wanted to do was work towards ordination. So, you know, we said, okay, if that's going to be necessary in order to have this church be established and last through the long run and then become 
what most people don't know today, there are Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, and now Michigan have adopted, officially adopted the programming model where inmates can become ordained and lead constituted churches inside facilities. So that little idea has birthed into a national movement in ways that I could have never imagined. And the reality is the hope, of, you know, the local church is the hope of the world. It's where we all go. It's where we find fellowship and love and being and, you know, that koinonia we all talk about. So by that point, Robert had showed up at Angola. We were on the cusp of that, and we became very quick friends, and Robert um, and I are an awful lot alike, and uh, we became very dear brothers, and we started to realize that these things could happen by nurturing the right relationships and honoring the right people who had followed Jesus and believed in the face of all those nevers. So that's kind of what happened by the time we met you in 2014. And you know, you gotta remember, I had I graduated in 2006, so my insatiable appetite for all things, you know, church, like church history, you know, studying worldview, going back and looking at the church fathers and major adherence to major educational moves all through Western society and um, I had been begging for graduate level work for a very long time, you know? So by the time that you showed up from Southeastern, we were in the middle of that and I see, you know, Miss Sandy Vandercook's over there and geez, those dreams started to happen and uh, that's where Robert showed up. So that's kind of how we met you and ended up being the people that were able to curate that story and I think maybe give you access into something that was a little bit more than surface awareness, like, oh wow, here's this crazy program and how does it work? to better inmates and blah, blah, blah. Right. So that's where you entered in. Yeah, and I remember both uh, y'all were in that, the grad program at the time, and when we walked out, we said, man, those guys could easily do PhDs in our institutions. Mm -hmm. Then fast forward, I guess it's 19, fall of 19, I'm here now, and I'm at Angola, and I think uh, ran into both of you still because you hadn't been released yet, and then you, you were still there as well. And I said to you, hey, if you ever get out, you come, Let's do PhD. So we're looking at those things. Tell us real quick before we. I want to just. I want to talk about where you're at now, what God's doing in your life now, what you see moving forward. But before we do that, before we leave the. I mean, I just want to note, it is a major providential deal that there was a church that started in Angola. Just to put that in perspective for you all as students, they participated in the Washington Baptist Association, which means. They are participants in the CP program, which means this prison program is helping fund your tuition. Just to kind of put that into perspective, this is what God is doing here, and that's just crazy cool and providential. Um, but it's also providential because I can tell you in North Carolina, while they were very willing, the state, while the state was very willing to let us do these kinds of programs, the very thought of having churches was a major no no. Yeah, and that may have changed now, I don't know, but they were like, no, 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 we're not doing that because that would give pastors authority over people, and that's just one more thing. So that's the kind of thing that just for us to appreciate in God's providence sure. that there was, you know, role players there that were willing to do that. It's also the kind of thing for us to be mindful of and prayerful of. Real quick, tell us what, what kinds of things did you see God doing through the church and how God's working in the prisons? Oh, holy cow, that's a giant answer, I know. giant question. <laughs> the redemption of souls mainly, right? Um, and then the, how that affects community, and it's huge. Um, but more importantly, I think it's worship, authentic worship in situations where Christ is most glorified. Yeah. I mean, it's out of the grave from whence he came. And, there are situations and like that that kind of bring us so close to that realization here in this walk of life that um, provide us with glimpses to the power of the resurrection like very few things. So that's what, how and why it's so important that the church is um, a frontier setting in institutions in America. Quite frankly, it very well may be the last geographical frontier, geographic frontier for church planning in America. We've got, I would say, millions upon millions of men and women in prison who, I mean, if I had to say it in a way they've come to learn, I think I've, I've said it in a way before to where I've come to believe that if it's not love, it's violence. If it is not from love, it is by default violent. 
So learning how to love, learning how to be loved, learning how to trust the Lord. And then when you have church in prison and you have people such as yourselves who are willing to come and give us the benefit of the doubt, then you allow us to be rehumanized. You allow us to be brought back into the love of the church body at large. And we then begin to realize this isn't just some little church jailhouse religion click group going on to kill time until we get back out. We're actually true believers, redeemed, reborn, and now we participate in the church at large worldwide. And by letting us get ordained, by scrutinizing us, letting us found churches, let us go to seminary, let us begin to do these things, well, then here we are. We got out. And now we're able to continue on in the church vein, in the, cinema, in the seminary vein, and everything that we learned how to do through everything that you all afforded us, now here we are able to continue it. So that's what church and seminary in prison did for us. You know, otherwise, there's no telling what we do. We might be just, we, get, we might have got out anyway, but we'd be flipping burgers or digging ditches and might not know Jesus at all. So, or dead. Yeah, or an, dead. An so thank you point, very much though. for us I, being here today. I think there's you know? something. <laughs> Maybe something that needs to be brought home here to kind of um, kind of Louisiana. Louisiana does church per capita more than anybody in the country. Every Sunday there are more people in church in Louisiana than anywhere in the nation per capita. Now you ready for the kicker? We incarcerate people here in Louisiana more than anybody in the world. So that should lead the reasonable thinker to believe that there's an intersection in the church for those who have been victimized or those who are victimizers, and it is a wonderful opportunity for the redemption of the Lord to take place. So when a situation like that comes to bear, it's like how many more wonderful opportunities can be brought out of stories like this when you realize that this is the reason that Jesus died. And then you have this geography that's so very important like Louisiana. It's like, wow, wait a minute, there, the math supports the intersection for redemption and healing. And, you know, more often than not, I think the church doesn't necessarily know that that's a reality. Go ahead. I love the sound of that kid, by the way. That's awesome. <laughs> Making noise? Yeah, we don't get little ones in church in prison. It's much better. <laughs> Look, it's much better to have the sound of the babies in prison than the sound of no babies in prison. So, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for bringing them today. We're going to go eat. I want to encourage you all to come, fellowship. Uh, these brothers are going to be around tonight. Tonight we also have our fall festival. All of you are welcome. Please bring your families, your kids. These brothers are going to be with us tonight, so make sure that you're there. Grab them, talk to them. Um, can I just encourage you? Look, this is a God is doing some amazing things in places that nobody's going to see and nobody's going to know about, but it's precisely the kind of thing that God does, right? Um, I want to encourage you, have these brothers into your church. Week, you can connect with my office, specifically Chris Schaefer. He helps schedule some things related to my schedule and their schedule, but we will help you make that connection if you need it. But have them come into your church, your state conventions, and things like this. Let's tell the story of what God is doing. Brothers, I love you, and I'm grateful for you, and uh, thanks for being here with us today. Let's give it up for these brothers. Let me pray for us. Let me pray for us, and can I just encourage you, go preach the gospel to somebody, right? Amen. He saves people, and he does amazing things that only he can do. Father, we love you. We are grateful for your kindness and your favor to us in all things. Bless us. Help us to be the men and women you've called us to be. Make your people strong for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.